Welcome to the Myth and Magic Authors Podcast, folklore and fantasy topics aimed at creative storytellers. To write stories and challenge your brain with exciting ideas, delve into these presentations and reflections. See how fantasy realms are based on actual world history, legend, and lore. Study fairy tales, nature fables, and supernaturalism to engage in a jumble of concepts that will trigger your fancy and get you writing imaginatively. Now, here's your host, Neil Mack. Hello, fantasy fiction fans. So it's Easter week, as I think about the topics for this week's show. So my thoughts are, naturally, I think, drawn to the nature of belief. What is belief? And how can you, as a fantasy fiction author, build belief? How can you deploy belief systems and heighten belief in your plots and your characters and your world building? And how can you harness the extraordinary power of belief? So today I'll concentrate on just one topic, building belief, because I think it's a biggie. But I'll try to make it fun and interesting along the way, so don't panic. But first, a very big thanks to Krista Wallace, who I interviewed for last week's show. It was a lot of fun and very useful too, with hints and ideas and suggestions about choreographing sword fights and lots of great advice about audiobook narration. But just an apology too, because I mentioned that Krista is based in Coquitlam, but she's not. She's based in Port Coquitlam which is another place entirely, so I'm told. So, many apologies to Krista and all the co out there. I recommend, though, that everybody listens to this show. It was a must-hear. It was episode 75 of Myth and Magic. It went out on the 31st of March, and I was interviewing Krista Wallace. But for now, belief. Are you ready? Do you believe in ghosts? Do you believe in fairies? Do you believe in unicorns? Do you believe in Santa Claus? Do you believe in Easter bunnies? Do you believe in magic? Do you believe in miracles? Do you believe in life after love? Asked Chair. It seems that believing in the fantabulous and perhaps even the slightly ridiculous is actually more reassuring and comforting than embracing the hard truth that I learned during a lifetime of hard knocks. But why? Why do we believe or do we choose to believe in unicorns and in miracles and in life after love, yet we ignore the stark truths that stare us clearly in the face every hour of our day? Why can't we just accept that there is no love in this world, only selfishness? Why can't we just accept that there is no great plan, only darkness? Why can't we just accept there is no promise, only uncertainty? Why can't we just accept that there is no future, only destruction? Why can't we just accept the obvious that all beliefs are nonsense? It's because nothing in this universe is as forceful and as overwhelming as the power of human imagination. Our mental images have taken us from the caves in which we hid and into a wider world with our flint tools and our fire, into a world where we expanded our minds to work on handicrafts and on art and on philosophies and on medicines and on religions and on sciences and even on technologies that allowed us to venture further afield beyond our own expectations and into places that Buzz Lightyear might have said were infinity and beyond. All these breakthroughs in philosophy, medicine, religion, science and technology were only possible because of belief. Belief is the power of human imagination. And belief isn't the fragile thing that some people might like you to think it is. No, belief is unshakable. Belief is resilient. Belief builds on belief to make itself even more invincible. And history is littered with the remains of the persecutors who discovered that for many, belief is indestructible. Belief brings dreams. Belief brings legends. Belief brings gods. And belief brings ghosts. And all that is true. 
But let's not forget that belief also brings recovery and it brings remedy and it brings enlightenment and it brings freedoms and it brings transformation. Belief isn't a bad thing. In fact, it's the ultimate good thing. It's the best thing that we do as a species. It's probably the best thing in the galaxy and belief is irrepressible. Fantasy fiction is built around the principle of delivering realistic mythos to an audience of people who are already believers. And we deliver our belief systems, our realistic mythos, in an entertaining and an imaginative and a compelling way. To build belief, and that is what we must do as fantasy fiction authors, we must understand a few basic elements about the nature of belief. So I'm going to go through the elements of belief. Number one, belief is an attitude. It's not an on-off switch. Number two, belief is based on shared creeds. Number three, belief encourages interpretations. Number four, belief is strengthened by systems. Number five, beliefs can be syncretic. Number six, beliefs are ethical, so should have a virtuous dimension. And lastly, beliefs offer a sense of community. So let's take each of those elements in turn, one at a time, and think about them in terms of writing fantasy and building plots and creating characters and fabricating worlds and even establishing an author brand. So the first is belief is an attitude, not an on-off switch. Being a believer is a way of thinking, and most likely it's a type of personality. Your readers are likely to be born believers, and you are too. Now, you might have guessed, if you've been listening to this podcast since it first started, that I'm quite religious, though you'll know also that I don't push my religion down people's throats. But I do occasionally get asked about my religious convictions, and I tell people who query me that I believe in God, and I try to go over the Apostles' Creed with them if they're interested. Now, if you're a Catholic, you'll know what I'm talking about when I mention the Apostles' Creed. But if you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry, it's not important. But I go through my creed in a friendly and a relaxed way. But some people who've asked me these questions, the most cynical of the critics, really, they point a finger and they say to me, how can you believe in all that bosh? Isn't it all a bit silly? What about the virgin birth? What about raising Lazarus? You're bananas to believe that, Tosh. They often make these statements in the manner of someone who possesses exceptional intellect and has spent many years on a mountain top meditating the complexities of world philosophy, and so they have a right to blow the lid off my idiotic assumptions. They look at me as if they think my belief is some kind of on-off switch that's set to either believe or not to believe, and there's no middle ground. They look at me as if they truly expect me to suddenly give way to their incredibly powerful argument and admit to them with a sheepish look in my eye, yeah, I guess you're right, I never thought of things like that before. Thinking like that makes me see the error of my ways, I guess I can't believe any of that stuff, so thanks for correcting me. But belief is more like a fuel tank than an on-off switch. Some days I'm running on the fumes of belief and I admit it. At other times my belief tanks are filled to the brim and I can run for miles. Most of the time though, I think I'm like other people. But I think my belief system is half full, stroke half empty. It's probably a bit like yours. And hey, why not? Because uncertainty is a human condition too. And also, I suppose it's true that some people are predisposed to false notions and fallacies. But keep in mind that the last time I looked, there were about 2 billion Christians in the world, practicing Christians, almost 2 billion Muslims, 1.5 billion Hindus, half a billion Buddhists, and another billion or so that follow other religions. If you accept that there are about 7.8 billion humans on Earth today, that means that the cynical and critical non-believers make up only about 12% of the human race. In other words, the non-believers are, in their own way, a self-imposed minority group. They're endangered. They're an endangered species. And I bet if you spoke to each of them, one-to-one, -one, 
they would believe in something, even if it was love at first sight or the genuineness of friendship. So I guess as a fantasy fiction author, your responsibility to yourself and to your readers is to respond positively to all beliefs, no matter how off the wall they might seem, and to be tolerant and to be open-minded, and above all, to be forgiving about beliefs. Not just about your own orientations and beliefs, but about other schools of thought too, about other perspectives. Because belief is an attitude, it's not an on-off switch. The second element is Belief is based on shared creeds. I spoke earlier about the Apostles' Creed, but I don't want you to be intimidated by the word creed. I know it sounds religious -y, but don't panic. It's just a useful word that means a symbol or a statement of belief. So if you wear a cross around your neck, or you wear a shark's tooth, or you wear a beaded necklace with runic symbols, or you wear a Daenerys Targaryen t-shirt, or you showcase your Hogwarts house on your social media page, then you have a creed and you're proud to exhibit your creed because your creed is just your symbol or your statement that you exchange with others to show them that you belong to their belief system and that you share the same thoughts and the same beliefs that they probably do. And they will most likely respond by showing you their creed back to you so you know you're all in the same house. Creed is expressing a sense of belonging and establishing a connection with others in the same belief group. Creed is why fantasy authors and fantasy readers stick together because we have a shared sense of solidarity and of kinship. We have a shared creed. The next element is belief encourages interpretations. Religious types spend years arguing about the finer points of their belief systems but before you murmur impatiently and you shake your head wearily about the silliness of world religions and their obsessive infighting, let's not forget that everyone gets angry and shouty about beliefs. Sports fans, for example, will spend hours objecting and defending and complaining and moaning about who is the best team or why their player is better than yours or what the referee did which made them lose points. And music fans will scream for their pop idol and motor fans will argue about cars and don't even get me started on politics. And the reason for all this squabbling is that there are so many inconsistencies and so many complexities, and let's face it, so many absurdities in every argument that has ever existed. Nothing cuts and dries, and humans love to squabble. Every issue under the sun can be questioned and it can be scrutinised, and that includes our beliefs. And we get more angry and we get more shouty when somebody challenges our beliefs because it hurts especially when their challenge is callous or dismissive. But interpretation is a vital component of faith. Belief encourages interpretations. Interpretation actually strengthens beliefs. So expect and embrace interpretations. The next element is belief is strengthened by systems. Fictional universes, myths, fables and legends, a bit like role-playing games and certainly like sports, work best when everyone sticks to the rules. Building a fictional world often involves maps and backstories and magical systems and even in some cases some made-up language. Think of the DC Extended Universe, the DCEU, and how fans and how media so quickly relied on conventions and basic laws and even standard assumptions before they followed the maze of tales that were churned out. And while there's been some high-profile tie-ins and link-ups between DC Worlds and Marvel World characters, how would you feel about a link-up between Harry Potter and Obi-Wan Kenobi? How would you feel if I told you that Doctor Who would appear in the next James Bond blockbuster? Or how would you like Optimus Prime taking on the Mother of Dragons? I don't think you'd like any of these tie-ups because these tie-ups would be stretching the legitimacy and the reputation of those fictional universes. Those universes are fictional, but they can still have their legitimacy and their reputation stretched. So consistency is a requirement of belief, and your consistency will be best preserved by adopting a set of standards and of principles, and then by sticking to them. So make sure your standards and your principles for your fictional world 
are set out quite early on and then remind yourself and your readers of those values as you go along. Soon you'll see that your belief systems will become self-regulating and your narrative will become self-consistent. The next element is beliefs can be syncretic. Having said all of what I've just told you about setting and abiding by rules for your fiction, rules for systems of magic, feasible technologies, alternative timelines, enhanced humans, paranormal powers, utopian and dystopian societies, etc. It's also beneficial to blend practices and include various schools of thought in your works. And that's what syncretic means. A Song of Ice and Fire is a great example. It encompasses beliefs from real world history, for example, the Wars of the Roses, which actually happened in England. And it also incorporates ideas that were first speculated in the novels by French uh, writer Maurice Drouin, and along with some standard medieval tropes that most fantasy fans are familiar with, in other words, castles, dungeons and dragons. However, by avoiding conventional confrontations between good and evil that are found in most fantasy titles, George R. R. Martin created something pioneering and also ingenious. But his work is syncretic, because syncretism is the combination of different previous beliefs to make a beefed up new belief. So yes, use what's been done before, but also try to make it identifiably yours by blending and combining. The next element of belief is that beliefs are ethical and have virtuous dimensions. To be of any beneficial use to society, beliefs must be healthy and positive in nature and in influence. The good must win in the end, heroes must improve, evil must be perished, diabolical monsters must be tamed or defeated, angels must triumph, superheroes must outsmart their enemies in the end. And your story should be no different, it should be an object lesson or a deterrent example because beliefs are ethical and have virtuous dimensions. The last element is beliefs offer a sense of community. When a believer thinks of his religion or his sport or his pop idol or his favourite fantasy series, it gives him, her or they a warm, soft feeling inside that outsiders and naysayers and unbelievers will never experience. It's a sense of wholeness and connectedness that sceptics and detractors will never come to understand and it comes from a sense of community because belief is a shared space it's like hiding in a secret treehouse with your gang imagine the feeling of warmth and acceptance when you hide in your secret treehouse Belief is about that type of acceptance, that warm reception. It's about tolerance, it's about membership, and it's about embrace. Yes, belief gives us a giant hug. And it's nice to be understood, and it's nice to be received. And belief does that. Belief welcomes us in. So be sure to develop and to grow your sense of community inside and outside your fiction, and you'll reap the benefits of belief. So let me know how you're doing with your belief building. Have a good week. If you have any suggestions or any advice or any comments, please contact me. Tweet me at Neil Mac, N-E-I-L-M-A-C-H, or one word. Otherwise, I'll see you next week. Have a great writing week. Mm-hmm.